Hey, fellow tennis nerds, I hope all is well. Here's another podcast, and a guy you are probably familiar with is one of the most popular podcast episodes is with Hendrik. We usually talk a lot about rackets because Hendrik is a proper racket and tennis nerd. He's been reviewing rackets for Tennis Nerd, but also for the Swedish Tennis Magazine for a long time. He tests everything, as do I, so we have a lot to talk about. So if you're into rackets, strings, gear, shoes, whatever, uh, listen to this one. How are you today, Hendrik? I'm good, thanks. Um, the spring has finally arrived here in Sweden, so now it's time to rock and roll out on the clay. Yeah, yeah, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure you're excited. I mean, you showed me the hockey goalie mask, which is your other passion, uh, just before we started. So the hockey season is, is gone now in Sweden. Yeah, for me at least, um, I play like in a senior recreational team. Um, but our season is uh, about to end now. Uh, the playoffs is in the finals, and uh, yeah, now it's more more about summer sports here in Sweden. So. The hockey season is soon um, coming to an end here. So it's all about tennis from now on. That's great. That, that's what we need. And you have a really cool hoodie on uh, RS hoodie. Yeah, I got some. Um, I mean, I like the the colors uh, of the new RS collection. Uh, they sent me a, a bunch of uh, new uh, shirts, shorts, um, hoodies, etc. to try. So I think we will go through a bit what I will be trying uh, in the next coming weeks. But uh, yeah, I really like the RS clothing. Um, that's pretty much the only thing I use um, both on and off court, apart from when I'm at work, of course. Yeah, of course. Yeah, and with work, you need to to look the part. Uh, but we also tried a bunch of different rackets from different perspectives. Uh, last time we talked, you tried tried the Pure Drive ninety eight, and now I've tried it a bit more. I'm working on the review. Uh, we have uh, also our Tango rackets to talk about. Nick went to, went to this uh, event in Lyon, um, in Lille, sorry, and uh, I couldn't go that time because I was moving house in Malta. But it looks like they put a lot of effort into tennis now, the Catalon and their Artengo brand, which is the tennis racket sports brand. What is your feeling about these frames? I did try the control racket and I was really positively surprised. I mean, it wasn't like a home run, but for the price, it was very, very good. Uh, and and very predictable compared to many other frames. So yeah, what are you, what are your thoughts? It's this one, uh, the Artengo Tour, uh, the Artengo TR nine sixty Control Tour. Um, overall impression is is very good. Um, it's a very solid racket. Um, it's a I've tried the sixteen nineteen version. Um, I think that Artengo has been looking quite a lot at Wilson, at Wilson's direction. I would say this is like a, um, the closest thing would be like a Pro Staff 97. I would say something like that. Um, it's it, yeah, it, it's a good feel. Maybe the sweet spot is um, the sweet spot is pretty small. So when you are hitting outside of the sweet spot, the racket lacks some mass because the swing weight on all our Tango rackets is very, very light. And I think they are focusing on faster swings. So if I was to use this one, I would play some lead here or maybe here in this area to get a bit more twist uh, stability. Uh, as it is now, it was very light. So um, yeah, it's it's a good platform racket. Um, good to use for um, lower level players that needs to swing fast to or like to swing fast. Um, good players must customize it a bit to get some stability but it's a good racket it's a good feel I mean considering the price um, it's a home run for a lot of players I would say I mean it's at least half price compared to uh, most other competitors and um, it's a good design as well um, yeah a, a good racket that needs some uh, some customization to fit everyone <clears throat> but the but the base model, really good, really surprised uh, with everything in it. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I, I was um, was impressed. I mean, I felt the same way you did. That at a control racket at ninety seven or ninety eight square inches, you can't have it at that low swing weight because then the ball outside the sweet spot is is just you know dead. So you need to add some mass. Once I added mass at twelve, you can add it at three and nine, ten and two, depending on what you like. But then it started playing much better, and I think it's a it's it's a it's a demanding racket. If you want, you don't get any free power with it. It's a control tour, so that that makes sense. It's the one that Monfils uses. 
uh, with a lot of weight, obviously, and customization added to his. But um, they also have uh, some other ones. They have the TR930 Spin, I think it's called. And then there's the TR990, which is the power racket that Kasatkina is, is endorsing. Um, as far as I, yes, that's the, the TR990 Pro. Uh, and there's an extended version as well, but I, I don't think you've tried that one. But this, what did you feel about the, the TR990? That's more your kind of spec range, I would say. With some yeah, this um, it looks like this uh, the TR 990 Power Pro or Pro with power. Um, I, I mean, this one has also a very, very low swing weight. I think the swing weight was like 295 strung. Um, pretty open string pattern as well. Um, it actually feels both the um, this one, the TR990, and um, this one, the TR930 Pro, the spin version. Um, both rackets actually feel like um, they, they feel somewhat similar. Uh, I prefer this one, the blue racket, more. Um, the first time I was using it, I was using it in stock weight with the factory string. And it was so easy to just hit from the baseline. But as soon as I was starting to play in points, it was way too light. I think swing weight was 297 or something. And uh, you didn't get any any plow through. Um, you didn't get any real pace on the serve compared to what you need against bigger players. So I was um, adding some, some lead, 3 and 9 and 12, to beef up the swing weight to something around 315, 320. Um, and then it was good. Um, it has some something of the dampened feel of the new Wilson rackets, like a bit of a clash, a bit of a ultra. Um, this, um, yeah, you know that unique, well, very well dampened uh, feeling that the most Wilson racket has these days. Yeah. Uh, the stiffness is very stiff. I think it's like 72, 73 or something, but you don't even notice that kind of stiffness. You have no arm issues whatsoever. Um, you have good spin, you have good power, you have good um, um, like good comfort in the racket. They are very, very easy to use. Um, I mean, very, very easy. And they, they, feel, they feel comfortable. And for a price of around... 120 130 euros each uh, it's a it's a steal of a deal it's it's they are really good like really successful for real um i i only would i would say or recommend that they would beef up the swing weight a bit because sub 300 strong swing weight that is just too low if they are aiming for some higher level players i mean it would at least be 310 or somewhere around there i mean it's not everyone that could customize uh, but they are very fast to swing. They look very clean. Um, people are noticing them for their design. The grip shape feels uh, just like it should be. Uh, grip four and three eight. It's uh, it feels like a normal grip three. Um, the shape of the grip. I don't know if you see it here, but it's um, they almost feels like. Um, almost like the old head uh, TK57 pallets. Not that extreme, but uh, a bit more rectangular than the regular rackets. TK82 um, maybe then. Yeah. Yeah, some uh, in that range, I would yeah. say. Uh, so it's pretty easy to play semi-Western forehands. Um, and I, I really like them. They are... Um, <laughs> they were really, really good. Uh the blue racket, it's uh, also, as you can, I don't know if you see it here, but it's, um, could it be like um, 0.2 inches longer or something like that? Uh, and um, then you understand that the, uh, the stock swing weight is very, very low if it's an extended racket. So it really needs some more mass in the head. Uh, but apart from that, um, they were surprising me a lot. They were much, much, much better than I was expecting. And when I have seen the videos from the Artengo event as well, I can really see that they are they are for real. They are really meaning serious business now. Uh, they are developing their rackets with um, like uh, they are really thinking about what they are doing, what they are going to produce. So I think that 
the big brands, uh, they really have to look out for Artangle because they they will gain market shares uh, with the price and the current situation of the economy. Uh, people will look into their products and um, yeah, the other brands uh, have to watch out because uh, they are coming strong, I think. Yeah, I agree. I, I think it's now that you have this pretty large barrier to entry with a racket like a pro staff. If you look at retailing at around 320 <clears throat> euros, I think the 97 or something. And it's, it's, it's just a lot of money compared to how it used to be. And uh, then people will either go for like the outgoing model, which is ch now cheaper because it's always like half price or at least kind of a lot of, um, you know, rebate discount on, on the outgoing model. Or they will look to other brands and other brands can come in and, you know, Dunlop rackets maybe a little bit cheaper or Tango even cheaper. They're quality brands. They make good rackets. Like you say, I also measure the swing weights to be a little low. So more mass, please, uh, or Tango. But otherwise, they're in moving in the right direction because they're new. Obviously, with the, with branding, you Wilson will sell a lot because they have a strong brand, as will Head, as will Babula. But at some point, if it, the price is too high, people will question, you know, if they're going to buy three rackets, you buy three Artengo, you you don't, <laughs> you hardly get one Wilson. So it's going to be a, a, a thing in the end, um, where, whether the price is, is too much of a factor. So yeah, it's it's interesting to see them. And I think there will be also maybe other smaller challengers now that it's easier to kind of produce good good quality stuff. Talking about swing weights, I wanted to get into that. Um, are you going to try the Pure Aero Rafa Origin, the new uh, beast of a racket? Is that on the radar for you? Yeah, hopefully. I've been in contact with Babala in Sweden, Racket Doctor. Um, and I hope to get some samples of both the, um, the Origin and the uh, Pure Aero Rafa. I think the Pure Aero Rafa will fit me and my game much better. I heard from Tennis Warehouse that the average uh, strong swing weight of the Pure Aero Rafa, the 290, 290 grams version was somewhere around 323 or something. And that's right in my ballpark. The Rafa origin, it's like 370 plus. And um, I... I'm too weak player to use that kind of uh, swing weight. And uh, I don't think that on the ATP tour, there are maybe 15 players that can use that in the long run. So it's um, okay. It's a nice, nice thing that they have um, the Rafa original specifications, but it's um, ex it must be the, the most demanding racket in modern in the modern era, so to say. And I mean, I know that uh, some rackets had some really high swing weight in the past, but in the modern era with such a powerful frame, it must be really hard to control the ball. Yeah, I think so. And I, I do wonder about it. I think it's a gutsy move and maybe it's because they think people will buy it and put it on the wall because it's like a Rafa original spec. But there's also a risk, I feel, for like rec players that they will buy it if they don't know a lot about rackets, they don't know anything about swing weight. They just want to buy what Rafa uses and they want to play with that. And then they buy that and they try to play tennis with a 370 swing weight. And it's also not like a 370 swing weight soft in mid-size prestige. It's actually, uh, which is will be easier to swing because it's a mid-size head size. So you will have a bit more maneuverability, will be easier to play with technically. Well, this is a like a, a rocket launcher, so it's like a, a very stiff, very high swing weight, 100 square inch, 60, 19 pattern. So, yeah, I, I'm seeing maybe some tennis elbows and possibly some some weird results from from this uh, this experiment, whatever you want to call it, because people did rush out to buy the Pro Stuff RF97 autograph. Many of them still play with them. I meet them and around the clubs, wherever I go, and they, it's not really the easiest racket to use, I would say for. For average players yeah i would say i would okay i have not tried them myself but just looking on the specifications if someone is choosing between the rafa origin and the rafa choose the rafa the lighter one because you will regret it there is um, one in thousand players that can use the rafa origin so choose the lighter one you will not you will not regret that. I think that's just my personal, just judging from the specifications uh, because I love the design. I mean, as you can see here, I'm a bit of a fan of the pink and purple stuff. Uh, so the design is uh, yeah perfect. So um, I hope I really get one soon so I can swing it on clay and pretend I'm Rafa. <laughs> yeah, that's what we have to do. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm getting 
one I think tomorrow uh, for tests, both of them actually. So from Tennis Warehouse Europe. So I'm I'm keen to see how they play. Uh, looking at the the specs, specs, uh, I I agree that the 291 will be for 99% the right choice. But if you really want to try this spec and you have money to spare or whatever, you know, or you want to demo <clears> it, I think it's it's fun to test the Rafa origin but i would definitely think that the other one is more human and you can always customize so you can add weight if you want a higher spec you know can it's you can't detract weight but you can always add weight it's good to keep that in mind so try to go for lower weight and be open to customization and and you'll be fine usually right yeah that's true um i mean it's not that many that can detract or remove weight so go for the lighter one or if you want to keep the other one for the wall like uh collector's item so it's your choice your money but if you are going to play with it i would say go for the lighter one 100 percent sure i agree and there's a lot of other stuff we talked about on the list before we we got going you also been testing the pro staffs uh and uh, we did also mention the shift which uh, a lot of people are kind of falling in love with but it, you know we i i in the end struggled a bit to control the ball with the shift at least the sixteen twenty, especially that that I felt like it was flying a bit. Um, how are your recent Wilson racket uh, tests? Because you're a Wilson Blade hundred player nowadays. Like that's the racket you, you yep. play your current uh, match play, customized. Yep. I assume, right? Yes, it's um, this one, the Wilson Blade one hundred, not the one hundred light, not the ultra light. It's the one hundred. Uh, Three hundred uh, grams racket. I've added some lead. I don't know if it's visible there, yeah. but you see it. Uh, I'm using the um, uh, Solinco Torbite 125 string at about, about 21.5 kilos and a nice Luxilon damper matching my hoodie. Um, and I have a pretty big uh, grip grip size 4. Um, and this, this racket is actually, for me, for my game, uh, I would say that this is the best racket I have, I have ever tried this is for my game this is like a racket that if i should design a racket this one would be it i like the the generation the version 7 um, but i had the blade 100l and then customized it and um, that had a stiffness of i think around 70 uh, this one i have not seen like the official stiffness rating of it i have seen some from decathlon at 70 but this is not 70 i mean I would say this maybe is 61, 62 or something when I feel when I swing it. It's it's it could not be a um uh a stiffness rating on no no I be I I cannot assume that in that case they have hide it very very well. Yeah. So I've actually ordered a couple of more now to use when I'm playing some tournaments and league tennis in Germany. Uh, so this one is the one that I will play with. Um, uh, and I mean, this is a 100, um, 16, 19. And when I compare it, for example, with the new uh, shift, uh, 16, 20, 99, I mean, it's virtually the same sitting area. But with the Blade 100, I can swing freely. I mean, the, I know where the ball is going every time. With the shift, I feel with the six, I have not tried the 18, 20, but with the 16, 20, I feel like the response is a bit erratic. Uh, I mean, some shots is landing right perfect, but I tend to hit long and I'm not hitting too long with like two centimeters. I'm hitting too long, like two meters with that racket. I And I've tried different string setups, uh, played around with lead, but I just don't get the feel with it. So maybe I, I don't know. I will, because the feel of the racket is really great. It's a racket I want to be able to use, but it, I, I cannot play well with it, but I, I will not give up because it looks good and it feels good, but I just need to find that depth control with it. And then I've also tried the Pro Staff 97. Uh, it's I strung it up with Champions Choice and it's I mean it's a demanding racket. It's a good racket, but I don't get anything free from, from it. The, the Blade 100 is better for me in each and every category. And I've also tried the, um, the Pro Staff X uh, the 100 square inch um, and looking at the specifications that's pretty similar with the blade 100 but the, the blade 100 is outplaying it in each and every category i mean it's just simply a better more solid racket for me so um 
the Blade 100 is my uh, choice for, for now. I mean, I will still try rackets, but um, it's the racket I will play competitive tennis with. In yeah, the and, and you you needed to uh, pick one as well for I mean you're like me we we never stick maybe too long with a racket although I'm I'm back to my old prestige now uh, since a while and it's playing better than I've done in a yeah probably before I would say um but it's just how it you feel you feel familiar and you find the spec and then you you feel happy but for you you're gonna play the the German uh, league and then you obviously want a racket that is a setup you can't go there with four different rackets it's gonna be. a a problem. I've I've done that, and I think you've probably done that in the past, but as well, right? Yep. Yeah. Guilty. <laughs> Guilty as charged. Yeah. So yeah. the Pro Staff X. Uh, I I I really like that racket in many ways, uh, and it's also one of those rackets that it looks pretty cool. It plays nicely. The feeling is is good, but sometimes the ball just goes where you don't know it's gonna go. It's like you you don't feel that confidence to swing out completely. And in pressure situations, that becomes like too much of an issue, you know, because you want to rely, you want you to make the mistake, not the racket to actually contribute somehow, uh, even if you somehow get more power at, at, at some case, in some cases. Uh, what, what was your reading of the Pro Staff X? Uh, erratic as well. Um, it has the Pro Staff feel, I would say. Um, it's a nice frame, just hitting, but then... I don't get the response I was hoping for. Uh, I didn't feel that the spin generation was that good. Actually, I don't know why, because the string pattern should produce enough spin um, or I'm using it in the wrong way, but I get more more spin and better slice with uh, the Blade 100. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I'm, I'm just not clicking with the, with the Pro Staff X. Um, Maybe I'm not hitting the ball clean enough, or I don't know. Uh, it was just not for me. Yeah, that can also be the case, you know. And I think we we talked about that in some podcasts ago, and I think we mentioned it a few times. I'm like this trend of, I mean, rackets not being ultra harsh on the arm generally, which is good, but then the dampening is is a bit much. And I think that's what I've seen in in kind of several brands now. It's like, and Wilson, they've done it pretty significantly, I would say, like from. I mean, the Ultra 100 was an improvement from the version 3, but then I don't 100% feel the ball. I had a little bit the same feeling now with the burn. I can see a target group for it, but for me, who I like to really feel connected to my shots, I can't play my best tennis with it. It's just simply the fact. I understand and I, I agree, um, especially in like in the Ultra. That is extremely well dampened, a bit almost too much, too muted. Um, the blade uh, is also very well dampened, but um, the the total the, the total end product in the blade one hundred is uh, it's just perfect. It's um, I could not have done it better myself. So in that specific racket, the dampening is just perfect, spot on. Uh, in the other models, maybe a tad too much. I mean, I'm trying the the. Uh, the Yonex V Core 98 and 100, and they are also very well dampened. So it seems like the trend is going towards more and more dampened uh, feel, like more muted feel, like uh, you have filled them up with silicone or something. And so they remove some some part of the old school feel. And I mean, it's pretty refreshing actually when Artengo is making that um, uh, control racket that is actually pretty raw. The feeling is pretty raw in it, so it's a bit refreshing that they are not everyone is going towards the dampening, um, the dampened um, direction. Maybe they are thinking more about the players' uh, elbows and joints, but um, they cannot remove too much. And now I think, as it is right now, um, with the tension going lower and lower as well, um, I would say now it's point of no return for the racket industry now i i don't think players appreciate more dampening than it is at the moment so they are not allowed from us to go any lower yeah no, no i i know what you mean i i completely agree i think it's it's just something to be be aware of for most players maybe that this dampening is just good uh, but i think if you test a lot of rackets uh, you get very specific i mean like you test everything you found the blade, you know that you love, I mean, you find that like a, a feel, a connection to it that you really love, you know, but um, 
we're all different. So some people might love the damp and muted feel, some people might not. So you, you always need to try. I think that is generally it. But it, it's definitely a trend, 100%. I see it with, with most brands, I would say. Uh, also, some uh, interesting balls you've been testing. The Prince Ball, the RS, they have some new balls. And another ball brand I've never heard about, which is very Swedish, called the Bostad Bollen. Um, so, and balls are very important, like uh, not only on guys, but also on tennis courts, you know? So it's very important to to understand like I, if i play with a like a ball i don't like i don't even enjoy playing tennis so for me it, it then becomes a, a problem this is interesting so so i have never seen or heard of this this brand this is bostad bollen uh, bostad is the atp tournament the atp venue of uh, the swedish open uh, bollen means yeah ball on swedish um and it looks like um, the logo is very straightforward it's Somewhat similar of the Roland, Gar Roland Garros ball. Um, when I was opening this can up, I had no expectations at all. I don't know if it was like a PR ball or whatever it was. But me and a mate, we played on hard court and we were blown away of the feel. I mean, it was by far the best feel ball when I mean when just when you opening open it up and play normally it takes a couple of minutes to have like the right feel this one was spot on straight away it was the feel was second to none it was perfect um <clears throat> the durability though I mean we were playing one hour um and you see it's showing some pretty severe signs of, of the wear. I mean, most balls do that on when you're just hitting strokes for one hour on hard court. But um, the bounce was still there. So it will be interesting. I will try them a bit more. I'm in contact with them now to get some more samples because I want to try them in, on clay. And I mean, one pack of balls can have like a different quality than another shipment. So... I will try them a bit more. Um, I've not heard about them before, so it will be interesting to see. I don't know if they are small, if they are like focusing just in Bostad or what are what their thoughts thoughts of are. So we have to return to to them as well. And then I've been trying the Prince Tour. I think the name is Prince NX Tour Pro. This ball is used for one hour as well, and you don't even see any wear on it. And I don't know if you hear the sound, but it's it's this ball is really hard. Um, I don't know if you remember Jonas the the old Triton Plus Triton XL balls, of course, the pressureless. Yeah. Uh, I would say they are when you are striking the ball, they are sounding a bit like a pressureless ball because they are very. They, I, I think, I presume that this ball is focused a bit on durability because this must be one of the most durable pressurized ball I have ever tried. They were not showing anywhere at all over one hour. Um, they were yeah, pretty hard. So I would presume that either they are considered for, um, for like uh, coaches and clubs that could use them but i think they are okay to use as well in um, in tournaments but the initial impression was that they are hard and easy to generate power and maybe not so good ball bite but the durability was extremely impressive i will try them i have a couple of um, cans more to try so i will try them out on clay as well and see how they perform in different weathers i mean here in sweden in the spring we can have plus one degrees and snow and when we are playing outside and we can have plus 32 degrees in sun. So it will be a very big difference uh, in the climate during the spring here. So it will be interesting to see how it performs. And then I've also been trying together with the um, Artengo rackets. I've tried the um, Artengo TB920 ball and this was the... Um, Moselle Open. I don't know if it's a special edition. I think it's just a regular ball, but um, um, it's just marked with um, the logo of the tournament. And this is after two hours of use. So um, pretty good durability or very impressive durability, actually, because we were using those at like in regular practice, no gameplay, just like hitting, hitting, hitting. Uh, the first, let's say, 10-15 minutes, the ball was uh, really hard, like 
like almost difficult to control, very fast, like extremely fast, lightning fast. But then the ball just opened up and uh, it played beautiful, really impressive of the both the durability and the playability after the first 10, 15 minutes. Um, I don't know the price of that ball or if they are available or where they are available um, in Europe. I think you can order them online on Decathlon. Um, but it was a really good ball. Um, I was surprised as well with the... Um, um, with the ball in the end, um, I mean, most players are just using the ball for 15 minutes to warm up anyway. That it's not like they are opening opening it up and playing a match. So it was a good ball. I only got one can, unfortunately, so I cannot try them more. But yeah, it was an interesting ball. Uh, then yesterday, when I got the stuff from RS, I got two new balls. Uh, I have not seen them on their homepage yet, though. Uh, but they said it was okay to mention them. Um, the first one is um, it's called Pro Edition. Um, it says that it's um, it has extra durability. Uh, mm -hmm. So I think it's like like the normal. I don't know if it's the black or white can, uh, but it's like the normal can, but better felt or something like uh, a bit more. Um, uh, durability on it so i only got this uh, three pack can so i will try it and i will of course let you know uh, then i know there are a lot of coaches asking for like uh, ultimate durability balls and then they have this one uh, practice edition uh, also a three pack ball i have not opened it up yet but both are itf approved uh, premium long-lasting tennis balls. Um, so I presume that they are focused more focused on durability. So I don't think the feel is the same, but it cannot be like durability and feel is not going hand in hand. So I will try them as well. So we have a lot of balls to talk about in the next uh, episode as well. Yeah, that that's always interesting because I think people um, sometimes mis underestimate how important the ball is. Like if you play with a bad tennis ball it's it's not even fun sometimes to play tennis like if you play with something that flies too much or it's just too heavy or or too uh, like really um too hard on the arm for example like a pressureless ball that that's uh, that's tough so it's not really it's so important to pop, buy the right ball for the right court and and use that i think that's and you see that's one of the most popular complaints among players is like they don't like this ball. If they go to an ATP tournament, they have a ball they don't like. Everybody starts talking about it. Like, I don't like this ball. I get arm pain from this ball. This ball is flying too much or it's too dead. That's sometimes the theme in, in ATP tournaments. Yeah, I've heard uh, in the German league or in the lower leagues, lower division leagues, I heard some um, um, tennis verbände, I don't know the English word, the... Um, Part of the um, association, you mean for Verband, for Bund? Yeah, the the um, the local, like the landscape um, in that area, area association. Some use the Wilson Trinity in league play, uh, yeah. and the complaint was um, huge from the, from the players, um, because they just simply don't like a pressureless ball. Uh, even if I personally actually like that one pretty much, but. Uh, and I heard there were some severe complaints. So I think they went back to like the a regular, um, like a regular pressurized ball. Um, so players are pretty much, um, when it comes to the ball, I mean, they can use different strings, rackets, but yes, the balls, they are very picky. That's the, I think in general, the ball is what the players are most picky about, what people tend to complain about the most. Yeah, I agree. I think that's, that's pretty common and you're seeing that more and more uh, now as well. And it also puts pressure on the ball provider because if all the players come out to talk about it publicly or um, you know, a bunch of them, then it's not going to look great for sales because who wants to buy a ball that the players don't like, uh, even if it's just that the pro players don't like it and, and so on. So normally what balls do you like to use? You play, you like the RS white or black can and then you Dunlop, Slasinger, what, what, do you have any favorites? Um, I think Wilson US Open is a nice ball. Um, I mean, performance uh, price ratio, that's a really good ball. The RS White Edition. Um, I, I, Yeah, I like the White Edition more than the Black, I think. The Black is, I think it feels a bit heavier. So the White Edition is really good. 
Um, what else do I have? Uh, I have been trying so many balls. The head, um, called Head Tour. Tour XT, yeah. That's a new the XT. Yeah. The new one. yeah. Uh, you see, yeah, this one, the Head Tour. Yeah, that's a really new that's tour, a, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that one is uh, really good. The XT or what it's called, I think that's more for hotter climates. Uh, but this one is a really good ball as well. Um, <clears throat> here in Sweden, Triton has a ball that's called Triton, Triton Series, a white can. Um, they have remade it, I think. They have changed the logo a bit. Um, but they also have like a can, a, um, a blue can called Wilson Series Control. And that ball is much better. But I don't have any sales of it in Sweden, so I don't know why. But that ball is really, really good. One of my favorite balls. Um, I would not say there are any real, like real bad balls these days. But uh, if I had to choose with a gun to my head, I would take the white uh, can of RS for for now. Um, hard competition with the head tour. That's also a really successful ball in my opinion. Dunlap does also make good balls, not the ATP, maybe because it's at least when I tried it a couple of years ago, it was wearing wearing out pretty fast, but. The the Dunlop Fort is a ball that suits me and my game extremely well. Um, uh, I would not say it's difficult to buy, but it's not that common here in Sweden. Slesinger Wimbledon is also a ball that I used a lot in the past. Um, not also easy to find in Sweden, but also, I mean, those are one of the best balls on the market. Um, so it more it tends more to to buy what the clubs are using and like you're buying a bulk discount from the club so and our club is using the rs or the Triton, Triton and that's what i'm using and um, so yeah i can play with pretty much all every ball except uh, like a, a true like a Triton xl or plus because they are they are hard yeah they're, they're too hard that's for me as well and uh, more for ball machines i would say yeah we, we can get to shoes i guess because we talked about that bit before i've been testing the new uh, vapor 11 the vapor pro 2 and uh, you've been testing asic shoes i haven't been trying any asic shoes of late uh, well, i have the lacoste ag 23 lt uh, which is uh, medvedev's alleged shoe always pros usually have some custom shoe stuff that they use or use older models that are then designed to look like the new model this is the same like rackets uh, but the lacoste i only play with one so far but i i did like it i did feel good i'm pretty picky on the dampening and uh, not sure about that one yet but comfort was good it looks like great it looks really nice uh, but what about you you've been playing with the asics shoes right yeah i've been trying the uh mostly the, the gel rest nine in hardcore version i got it them um, i got them to try in marbella in end of december um and now I just got the uh, the clay version, like a full orange bone pattern, a bit open here, yeah. you know, clay pattern. But um, so they have split the sole in three, as you can see. I think it is for um, flexibility or something. Uh, but um, if you are using like a clay pattern like this, you have to play on really like a fine true clay courts you cannot use it on the gravel courts that we have in sweden because then you will break your ankle straight away because this is too too coarse or too it's digging in too much into the our gravel it's not clay it's gravel uh, but on a clay court and, and clay is made of like crushed bricks um and there it's this one will slide perfectly so i will try to use them now uh, because I cannot slide on the Swedish uh, uh, gravel anyway, so I will use them to be able to to use them in the German league because there most clubs have really beautiful clay courts. And um, this shoe is I've it's one of the best shoes on the market. Um, some are complaining that it's too narrow, but I have a pretty wide feet and yeah, it, it works for me. But some would say that this Dyna wall is a bit too. Um, interfering but for me with the wide foot uh, i can i can play with them so um yeah it's a good i also have my old um added a soul court boost in clay soul so i will never give them up i think i will fix them with shugu when they are starting to wear out so 
but I will try this one on the clay now for now. So um, that's my me and Matteo Barrettini's choice for the clay season. Yeah, it's good. That's good. No, that I mean the Asics shoes generally. I mean Gellerts is my favorite, so I think that makes sense. Not of all shoes, but of of Asics uh, shoes. Vapor nine point five. I have the reissue. Uh, I'm gonna try that as well. See if it's as good as I remember it. But with Nike shoes, sometimes durability is a bit lacking, so you feel like you you break the shoe quite quickly, especially on some kind of harsher court. I would say, but but hopefully they hold up and are as good as I remember they they were. At least fit my foot pretty good. I would say, um, yeah. So lots of of things to to talk about, lots of things to to go through. Uh, how much do you get to play? Now you're moving out on the clay, so if things change a bit, you will play more probably on the clay, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's almost impossible to get like in a normal weekday. We have our courts are full from like two p.m. until ten p.m. So you, yeah, I mean Monday to Thursday or Friday, I cannot play. I play once, like Wednesdays with the team. And then you can play early morning or late night in the weekends. It's just sold out every time. We have like we have four indoor courts and twenty seven active teams. So if it's crazy. Um, we are a very popular club. Out on the clay, we have six clay courts. So now hopefully it will be I I could play maybe three or four times a week now. So and that's good. It's nice to be out moving again. Yeah, and. Uh... You see that generally, I think that's a common trend in Sweden, or at least what I saw in my hometown as well. We have a bunch of teams, two clubs in the same venue, and definitely not like six indoor courts, five clay courts to cover, or three clay courts to cover like a whole city of 160,000 people. It's not enough, you know. It's like the, we're, we're, we're lacking courts, I think, in Sweden overall. That's my, my feeling, at least. Yeah. Um, I mean, the paddle, the paddle era is. Um shutting down pretty fast there are i mean we're talking about every podcast but uh, the, there are a lot of clubs and uh, like yes and paddle centers that are closing down and i mean i'm not talking about paddle centers with one two courts paddle centers with 20 25 courts are closing down and then they are standing there empty uh, and the tennis clubs are just screaming almost in most like bigger clubs they are lacking courts uh, especially indoors and um, I mean, we could easily have like two, three more indoor courts and fill them up as well. Because nowadays, I mean, let's say that you are playing with adult an adult group one time every week and you want to play like a, just a casual one hour hit with your friends. There are not courts for that. And it's it's pretty difficult to find players that want to play six in the morning or like 10 in the evening. I mean, in bigger cities, they are maybe easier because they have no other options and it's leaning towards that in our city as well and um, that you need to play like really strange hours and it's not easy to find like the motivation or the hitting partners in those kind of hours because then it's interfering with the family life with work with the social life and yeah it needs more courts in most bigger cities in sweden i would say because tennis is even if our even if we don't have the same um, top level anymore, like we had in the 80s and 90s, we still have a lot of um, like recreational players. I think that's almost bigger than before because they are playing tennis. And um, yeah, so we need more courts in Sweden, that's for sure. Yeah, and tennis has been booming a bit. Uh, I mean, ever since the pandemic, uh, paddle there was a huge boom it's some people say it's still ongoing like it's still the sport is still growing but they just went crazy with the number of courts they were building because they they were anticipating way above what was i would say possible even you know if you look at it, the numbers you know so everybody wants to get in as soon as there is a trend everybody wants to get on the money train and you know capitalize on, on the on the trend so i think that's what happened in a big extent in the paddle community because paddle, I mean, if I look here in Spain, it's, it's quite popular among all people as, as is tennis. Uh, but in Sweden, they, they built, I guess, these like, you know, big, big kind of warehouse feeling places, you know, with 15 courts, 20 courts of paddle courts so when there were none before. So that was a bit, bit too much. Maybe we'll see what happens uh, with that sport. But yeah, if, if there's, uh, if there's no room there, you, at least you can make them into tennis courts and use them for something. So, <laughs> That would have been good. Refurbish these places into tennis, 
or at yeah. least mix it up so there's three paddle courts, five paddle courts, and then there's three tennis courts, you know, something like that, not just go all in for, on one sport. I think it would make sense, you know. Yeah, I think they will. Um, in the end, it would be good to have like a mix of tennis, maybe badminton, a gym, paddle courts, tennis courts, uh, maybe a cafeteria or a bar. Or, or not, that's not allowed in Sweden, I forgot. Um, yeah. I mean, imagine if we have like Germany where you have a bar at every club, the social, you can sit down and have a beer and um, grab some food a Tuesday night here in Sweden. If you are suggesting that you are. Uh, banned for life almost um there are a lot of things we could do to make uh, the club community more vibrant so to say yeah i think that that's the thing i noticed like also here in, in spain it's always nice that you can you don't have to have a beer but at least you have the option right so so it, it's like you can always sit down and the, the social aspect when you when every club has a restaurant uh it, it makes everything different because you stay around longer in, in sweden i always feel rushed i like okay i'm i'm done playing I have, I'm going to go home now. There's not like you can't really linger there. You know, it's not really welcome to linger around, which is a, which is a shame because you don't create this culture around it then. Yeah, that's true. <clears throat> cool. All right. So um, lots of new gear. Uh, do you have anything else on the horizon that you're looking forward to in, in gear wise? Some uh, yeah, I have. Uh, I got um, from RS. I have like uh, a bag. They are into... Um, I don't know if you see it, but they are into those um, cooler colors. You see a lot of um, lime, spring blue, stuff. Yeah. spring stuff. They have like uh, pink and white. And I also got some, um, they have started to make those um, like uh, functional socks. Pretty good price. I think uh, a three pack was like uh, $9.99 or something for... Um, for functional socks and that's a really good price so that's what normally most take for one pair i think don't take it for granted because i have to double check but i think it was something like that so i will try um i will try the rs uh, gear um, and i like clothing i think we need a podcast about clothing or i mean the, what's important with the with the material and the properties of good tennis clothing um and in new rackets, I hope to get, uh, I need to go, get in contact again with Babala so I can get the pure arrow, uh, the Rafa and the Rafa maybe origin, uh, mostly the Rafa, the lighter one. Uh, what else? Uh, I will try the, um, I actually bought those two, uh, the E-Zone 98 and E-Zone 100 of the, of the new version. Um, and I also built up the the butt cap because I cannot use the the Yonex in regular butt caps. So it will be very interesting to try the the E zone. I mean, I'm one and a half, almost two years late on this one, but I I never got them from Yonex, and I really want to try them before the. I, I presume there is a new generation next year if they are going to the regular plan. Uh, so I really want to try that one as well, but. Um, I think that will be after the league games and the tournament. So I think it will be now it will be not so much trying new like rackets and strings. Now I have to settle, play in on clay and really go competitive mode for two months. Uh, and then I will start to try a bit more in the summer again. Yeah, I think that makes sense. It's always good to have periods where you're not testing so much because otherwise your tennis falls apart. That's what I noticed at least. And uh, I have some strings to test besides the rackets. Quick note on the Pure Drive 98. Uh, it's a pretty fun racket to use. I mean, on serves, it's amazing power. I mean, I'm working on the review, so you guys listening here will will have seen or will soon see the review. And it's it's a, it's an interesting stick. It's quite stiff. I know I felt like it is a little bit stiff, but I, I strung it 24 kilos, which is maybe a bit high uh, for this racket. But on the other hand, you get no control if you string it lower. So it was like just uh, that with, with the new RS... No, the new um, Racer Soft from Technifiber, which seems to be a pretty good oh, string. Uh, forgot. Uh, I will get the Racer Soft as well. Uh, I forgot about that one. Um, I've heard a lot of good things about it, so it will be really, really interesting to try that one. Sorry to interrupt. No, 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 no. It's a good interruption. And uh, yeah, yeah, that, that one seems good. I'm, I'm going to try it in more rackets uh, as well, not only the, the Bubble one, but also in my standard Prestige. And, and I'm also testing some other strings, testing the, um, the Luxlon Eco string, which is very different from other Luxlon strings with like six-sided 
a very green string. Uh, I'm gonna test that. I haven't tried it yet. I haven't strung it up. And then there's some grapple snake strings. So it's quite a lot of strings. But a string test is if you have four different rackets, it's not as much. Oh, there we go. Here we see some strings. I think this one is the echo. Yeah, yeah. And I have one. If if this one is out, um, I don't know if this one is out yet. So if it's not, you have to. Um, I will edit it. <laughs> yeah, uh, this one. Yeah, that's out. Yeah, I've seen that one. Yeah. 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 Um, and this you haven't always... tried yet. This is just for you to string up in on the Bayardo behind you. Uh, yes, yes. Bayardo is a really nice machine as well. In the Davis Cup, we are stringing on the um, on the head machine, so um, they are both great machines. The Bayardo is a really good machine with the the tilt function. I would say that the head machine is a bit faster. Like when you're doing a speed job, it seems like I just string a bit faster on that machine. So they are both great machines. The Bayardo, I mean, it's a luxury to have it at home as well. Yeah, of course. Yeah, and, and uh, do you have any more? What's the situation with Davis Cup? Are you um, traveling anywhere or stringing for the Swedish team as you usually do? Uh, yeah, we are in the um, in the playoffs in uh, in uh, in September. We got drawn against Italy uh, with Sinner, Berrettini, maybe Fognini, Uleli. That's true. Uh, and Canada with uh, Felix and uh, Shapovalo, and uh, Chile with uh, Garin, Jari, Tabio, Barrios. What is his name? Yeah, the the Barrios Vela or something. It's an extremely tough draw, but we got to play in Bologna again, and the food in Bologna is uh, it's good. Yeah, maybe uh, maybe we should um, find an excuse for you to visit Bologna this time. Uh, I think you could do a lot of good content there as well. Yeah, that would be cool, actually. It would be nice to have some uh, some more tournament stuff. I, ho I hope to do more traveling now that I'm, I'm more settled in Spain. So I think that would be great to be visiting a few more tournaments uh, during summer and also after summer. Welcome to Bologna. I would yeah, take yeah, care yeah. of you. No, I love Italy. It's always nice, especially the food, like you say. It, it's, uh, it's tough to resist all the good stuff yes. they have and the wine yeah. as well is, is extra extra nice yeah everything in italy is nice i mean the the people if you just now we are going off topic but the, look at That's the people fine. in italy they are so uh, so classy they are um, well dressed they are making a good uh, very good food and um, they are taking care of themselves like very yeah, groomed yeah. and yeah they they know how to live nice life people. they they respect their yeah. life right That's yeah pretty cool um Nice, yeah. So Bologna for for Davis Cup, and yeah, it's a tough tough one. Huh? But do you follow the tour or anything? Do you watch any uh, ATP stuff now, at the moment? Yeah, I'm following the Swedish guys, both on the Challenger and um, ATP level, and also some guys in the Swedish Davis Cup team that plays in the Futures. Uh, Nicolas Madaras, that you help. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he's a machine on the Futures tour, and he's on a career high now of about two fifty. So I think he will soon be into Grand Slam qualifications and. I'm following guys like Philip Bajevi and Jonathan Mida on the Challenger Tour, Leo Boy as well. Um, Carl Friberg has also made some nice progress, winning some first rounds in the Challengers. Um, Andre Jöransson in doubles is closing in on top 50 in the world. Wow. And then we have um, Mikael Uma. He's injured now, but he's uh, at top 50 ATP singles. And then I'm watching Elias Uma as well. He's struggling a bit now with his ranking, but he has a very high level, so it's nice to follow those guys. But I also, I mean, I have tennis TV, and so I'm trying to watch as much as possible just to keep up up to date, so to say. Yeah, yeah, I try as well. I mean, I have, haven't been able to watch that much lately, but I was I was fun that that Rublev won the Monte Carlo because I thought he deserved it. He's been such a good player for a long time. Seems like a nice guy, and it's nice for him to actually win the tournament. And nice to have some new winners in general. I think tennis needs a bit of, of like spice, spicing up. So it's a pretty good good time. And now we have the clay with uh, Alcaraz and uh, Sinner playing amazingly well. And, and obviously always Novak and maybe Rafa. Who knows if he returns in time. But uh, yeah, he seems to be quite injured. I don't know. Do you, think, um, do you think Rafa will try to make it for the French Open and then uh, wave his goodbye? Maybe I mean it. It's not impossible if the um, the injury is worse than maybe we think. Like I mean, I think he wants to play 
until he sees Novak <laughs> give up, kind of. You know, they want to be like, oh, yeah, no, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stay there if he wins too many slams. It looks very tough to. Um, I mean, they're on the same now, but it looks tough for Rafa to compete with Novak. I think Novak, you know, going to Wimbledon, he's a clear favorite, uh, and also, you know, next year Australian Open hard courts, he's he's gonna pick up more slams. It's very hard to not see him do that. Uh, so maybe Rafa understands that and then kind of gives up on the race or he's just so injured that he can't really give more than he, you know, maybe one more slam, like a final finale hurrah in, in, in French Open. I don't know. I mean, I've seen him on the practice courts in, in Mallorca. Looks good, but then he withdraws from the Barcelona. He withdrew from, from Monte Carlo. So, um, yeah, who knows? He usually comes back and, and plays much better than everybody thinks. So it's hard with Rafa. It's hard to predict. What do you predict for him? I, I think that let's say he's playing French Open and losing first round against um, no disrespect, but let's say Carbaez Baena is beating him. Um, no disrespect, disrespect. He's a good, he's an ATP winner, a good guy. But let's say I don't think that Rafa would like to end in that way. And uh, then maybe he will, yeah. Um, maybe go out in US Open or something like that. I think he will it depends on how it goes in the in the French Open. Let's say if he wins, I th- I think depending on the result in French Open, I think I think he actually will retire, but I don't know. I mean, I don't have any insight, but considering his injury history the last couple of years, um I think that um, I think it's soon time for him to like say Thanks for me, and this is who I want to be remembered for. I don't think he wants to go out and lose twelve straight first rounds and then wave his goodbye. So, yeah, I would I would actually say a good result in the French Open, and I think he will say his goodbye to tennis. Now he's a father, and I mean he's thirty six or something like that. So uh, I think that it would be like a good ending for him if he's doing a good result in the French Open. Yeah, it would be. I mean, usually it's always a question if they want to do like some kind of farewell tour, like be like, okay, I am now coming to Barcelona. But then it obviously depends on how good your body is. Like, I mean, for Federer, it was kind of, you know, he stayed away from the sport for a long time. Then he played a little bit. Then it was clear that he was so injured that it was going to be tough for him to compete. And then when he announced it before the Labor Cup, I think it was pretty clear. Like, And I, I also think, I think it's enough with one big tournament and say bye instead of having like oh this is my last season I'm going to be playing every event you know this season because it's it's going to be tough for these guys they are getting older so their body might not hold up then for the the whole whole season all the events and then that becomes a problem as well so maybe maybe you're right maybe it's good for him let's say if he wins I think if he wins it will be tough for him to say I think he would be like yeah I can still do this <laughs> you know one, one thing that is for sure is that Rafa will be extremely missed uh, he's like yeah. a, a bull, a raging bull, a great fighter. As soon as, I mean, Roger, Rafa, and Novak, those guys, um, they are one of a kind. I, I don't think we will see that kind of rivalry in the future in pretty much any sport. Um, so they are three unique uh, players uh, that we are very happy to to have uh, be able to see in live. Yeah, 100% agree. Uh, they, that's that's interesting. That's why it's such a big thing if someone decides, if one of them decides to quit. And uh, yeah, you know, for Rafa, it was maybe a big thing with the motivation when Roger left, you know, because it was such a big part of his career. And then now he's maybe, although it sounds strange, he's maybe a little bit lonely, you know, it's like he doesn't have Roger around. So it's not that kind of rivalry that they were, they grew up with. But uh, yeah, who knows? We'll see. We'll follow it. Uh, cool. Well, well, thanks a lot, Henrik. Uh, I think that's a good Thank note you. to end on. Pleasure to be a guest here. I'm honored. <laughs> yeah, there's no honor, but that's cool. That's cool. Um, all right. So we talk very soon then. Thanks a lot. And Thank if you, you want to, let's see, do you, um, where should people reach you if you want to follow you? Uh, on Instagram. It's my name, Henrik.Wallenstein. Yeah. Uh, that's the best. W A L L E N S T E N. I think you can write it in the. Yeah, yeah I'll put it in the description well. and in, in, the, in yeah. the notes. So. People yeah. can follow you. And then there you post a lot of stuff about gear and stuff as well. So it's, it's kind yeah. of relevant. And some pizzas as well. Some pizzas, yes. And you have a really fancy pizza oven. So um, I always get, get very hungry when you when you post a, a pizza. It's like a good pizza is, is hard to beat. Yeah, I totally agree. <laughs> cool. All right. Thanks, Henrik. Thank you.